Joining me once again is our good friend, Captain Retired Kevin Hoser Miller. For those who don't remember or people new to the channel, Hoser and I served together aboard the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower in the early 90s. Hoser has gone on to great things as a writer of military fiction, particularly the Raven One series, and also a fictionalized history of the Battle of Midway called the Silver Waterfall. And we had Hoser on last year, the 80th anniversary of this signature battle to talk about the battle in broad strokes. And I've asked him to come back on this year at the 81st anniversary of the Battle of Midway to talk about some other elements, some not talked about that much, and maybe it's because in one case where we talk about the flight to nowhere, it's a little bit of a dubious uh, circumstance for the U.S. Navy. So let's start by identifying the players, Hoser, from the very beginning. So three aircraft carriers, and then we'll describe particularly Hornet's situation and the principles involved in the flight to nowhere. On the morning of June 4th, 1942, off Midway, we had uh, Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher, commanded Task Force 17, aboard Yorktown. And he was also the overall commander to include Task Force 16, Admiral Raymond Spruance, aboard his flagship Enterprise and carrier Hornet. Aboard Hornet, it's uh, Captain Mark Mitscher, who had already been selected for Admiral uh, a few days earlier, I guess the, the official, but he was he was captain of, of Hornet then. And, uh, and his air group commander, Commander Stanhope Ring. Ring's squadron commanders, uh, he had uh, four squadrons, fighter squadron, Lieutenant Commander Mitchell, two uh, SBD Dauntless squadrons, the bombing eight is... Uh, Lieutenant Commander Ruff Johnson, Scouting 8, Lieutenant Commander Walt Rodi, and Torpedo 8, Lieutenant Commander John Waldron. As we described in our episode last year, we basically talked about Enterprise and Hornet and some of the happenstance, the fortuitous divine providence, if you will, that got them where they needed to be. But let's talk about Hornet. As you've said, they basically have three type model series, they have Wildcats, they have Devastators, and they have Dauntless. Wildcats are the fighters, Devastators are the low-altitude bombers, and Dauntless are the dive bombers. So the, this introduces a discussion, a tactics discussion about should the Wildcats be up high or low? Who are they covering? And the main issue is what's our heading? What's our vector once we're off the bow of Hornet and why would we head that direction? So let's talk a little bit about the choices they made from the outset with respect to that. That morning at uh, roughly 0600, uh, um, Lieutenant Howard 80 flying a, a PBY uh, Northwest of Midway found the Japanese right where uh, station hypo intelligence, uh, radio intelligence had, had predicted them. And uh, this is a famous, you know, uh, Nimitz turns to Commander Layton says, Layton, you are five miles, five degrees, and five minutes off. I mean, just an incredible intelligent success. So, so this information certainly is is uh, is heard aboard uh, Task Force 16 and 17. And Admiral Bruins plotted the uh, the position and and turned to, to his air officer uh, uh, Miles Browning said, launch everything you have at the earliest opportunity. Okay, so what 80 saw were two carriers. So he reports where they are, two carriers. Uh, four are supposed to be there. And, and this is what everyone knows. And this is the intel that no one really believed. I shouldn't say no one, but many did not believe on board Enterprise and uh, Hornet in Yorktown. But uh, wow, okay, there they are, right? When predicted, but okay, there are two, supposed to be four. Where are the other two? We'll come back to that in a minute. But uh, a course was plotted from the flagship Enterprise 240 to intercept. So the Japanese are here, they're moving at at whatever course and speed. So we're going to launch at this time and we're going to fly a heading of 240 to intercept them. 
that was that was the game plan. And so this is this is at uh, you know between 150 to 180 miles of range from the American carriers. Um, that that increased because the ships had to turn into the southeast wind to launch. But uh, just another another factor. Uh, so so two four zero aboard Hornet. Uh, they they uh, the word is all right. Commander Ring Stanhope. Uh, you are responsible for your air group. You are not responsible for whatever Enterprise is doing and vice versa. So each group commander, Wade McCluskey and Stan Hopering, you got your own group. Don't worry about the other guys. So Hornet was the only ship to, uh, to launch a coordinated attack of 59 airplanes. So led by Commander Ring and, and uh, 15 uh, TBD Devastators, uh, Roughly eight Wildcat escort fighters, and, and the rest of them were uh, were dive bombers from the two SBD squadrons, um, bombing eight and scouting eight. They all left the ship at the same time. So now, now you and I know how long this takes. So in the way they launch is the, uh, the the fighters, you know, the, the Wildcats can use a short amount of deck to get airborne. They're not all that heavy. And now here come the scout bombers that are carrying 500 pounders. Here come the bombing squadron that are carrying 1,000 pounders, so they need a lot more deck to get airborne. Then what happens after that? They have to bring up the torpedo planes and, and push them aft and, and, and start them. And they need all that deck run, you know, to take off, you know, with that, that underpowered engine in the TBD and a 2,000 pound Mark 13 torpedo. All this takes time. By the time the last of Waldron's TBDs gets airborne, they get joined up. And there's photographic evidence of this, that they all moved out together you know the, the fighters have been airborne for about an hour and and the and the Dallas is you know you can you can, so you know they're already low on fuel McCluskey and, and Enterprise they flew down a heading of 240 saw nothing and McCluskey famously he, he pressed on a little bit and then he turned to the northwest and then eventually found a Japanese destroyer that led him to Kido Butai roughly three hours later the air group commander ring uh, flies back aboard Hornet and just has a handful of airplanes with them. Just another uh, another 19 airplanes, mostly from the scouting squadron, just a handful from the bombing squadron. And so, you know, imagine your captain mixture and, you know, where is everyone? You know, we haven't heard anything. And, and oh, my gosh. So I, I, I talk about this in the Silver Waterfall. You know, to, to imagine, you know, being on that bridge wing and having that conversation. What happened? Where is everyone? What did happen to uh, to Hornet's air group? They went out and didn't see anything. Just like Enterprise's air group went out and didn't see anything, but was led by McCluskey to the northwest and then finally to the north. And uh, Ring's game plan was to, uh, if he got to the end and saw nothing, he was going to head toward Midway and, and, and thinking that the Japanese were still going to press toward Midway. Now, uh, before all this happened, there was an argument on Hornet's uh bridge and Lieutenant Commander John Waldron, he piped up as, as he was wont to do, says, no, they're, they're not going to be there. They're going to be, they're going to be farther north than that. They're, they, they know we're here. We know they know we're here. We just saw that the, the super fly over us. And, and so they, they don't need to press midway. They're going to be farther north ring and Mitchell overruled him. No, we're going to fly two, four, zero. So just fly formation. So we know that Waldron broke off. And, and led his squadron right to the Japanese, as uh, Ensign George Gay did, uh, said, and, and to their uh, destruction, sadly. What happened to the others? Now, during this flight, first the, uh, the, the, the VTs left, and, and Waldron you know, basically told his air group commander to jump in the lake. Soon the fighters started just, just leaving in, in ones and twos and then in, in, in larger groups because they were, they were in extremis. They were running out of fuel. So it, it just turned around. Uh, next, it was the bombing squadron. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Johnson you know, led his guys to the, uh, to the south, southeast toward Midway. And then finally, the scouting squadron just couldn't take it anymore. And so everyone abandoned the, the group commander who continues on a heading of, of 240. But years later, a, uh, one of the fighter pilots uh, of the eight, you know, most were picked up, but two were lost. And, and one of those lost was Ensign Markland Kelly. And Markland Kelly, uh, you know, his family, is so many families in World War II, you know, what, what happened? I mean, you get a telegram, 
you know, missing or, or presumed dead. I mean, that's all you have. And, and, and maybe you might get a letter from a friend, hey, this is what we think happened. But they were always troubled over the years, long after the war was over. You know, what, what happened to our son? Um, Kelly had a college friend uh, who went into the Marine Corps and he was a, a Marine Corps navigator, uh, Bowen Weishite. I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. And so, so decades after this, Weishite is now interviewing, and we're talking early 1980s now, so 40 years. And, and Weishite uh, tracks down uh, pilots that were in, uh, in the, the SBD squadrons and, and the other uh, surviving fighter squadron pilots and, and asks them, okay, what, you know, what, what do you think happened? You know, t- tell me about that day and, 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 and the heading. And uh, Weishite believes that Hornet flew 240. And he, as he starts digging in deep, talking to these guys, some of them say, no, we flew to the West. We flew basically 265. And he's like, whoa, but I'm, I'm not sure about this. But, but he's hearing this more and more. He also had um, the, the PBY Catalina that, that days later picked up some of Ensign Kelly's squatter mates. They're just scattered all over the ocean. Um, and uh, so they, they had this thing called a short snorter, which is a, a, a $5 bill. That's one of, the, one of the guys produced. I'm not sure if it was a pilot in the raft or, or one of the, the navigators on, on the PBY and, and wrote down the lat long where the individual was picked up. And so Weishite sees this and says, whoa, this is, this is 150 miles off. And what, what happened? So this gets into the, the saga of the, of the flight to nowhere. And I, I, it, it kind of it begins with, with Weishite's research here, but then now you're going to go back in the midst of time, 40 years and in, in his interviews. Why go 265? Well, the, the, the theory, and this is a theory, is that the, we, we see two Japanese carriers or the PBY-80 found two. We, we know or suspect there are four, you know, where are the others? And so maybe on uh, Hornet's bridge, they just said, okay, we, you know, the Enterprise guys are going to go 240. We know they are. Um, that's the direction they told us to do. We should go 265. And, and that's, that's going to you know, put us to, to the north of, of that track, obviously. And, uh, and that's, that's probably where, where the Japanese are, are going to be. Well, let's, let's investigate that a little bit. You, know, you, know, we, you and I learned in flight school that uh, uh, every degree of heading subtends one mile at 60 miles. So at 180 miles on the arc, we're talking 75 miles. And, and uh, you know, the 240 heading was going to intercept, you know, that arc is, you know, tangent to the Japanese track. Uh, 265, you would you'd have to go past the arc and continue on for a period of time. Uh, and and this, this is going to run the, uh, the VF fighters and the, and the VT TBDs out of gas. Why would why would they do this though? But this this is a, a in in Weishite's research, he's talking to these guys and he hears two six five. How can that be? He he, he interviews some of the pilots who uh, talk about two six five. Then others are saying, "No, we were on two four zero." And I remember two four zero. And and one of them was uh, Ensign Clay Fisher, who I had spent some time with in the Silver Waterfall. And he was flying on Ring's wing, and uh, and he was you know there to kind of help the air group commander with his navigation. You figure, okay, here's an ensign helping the air group commander, and, and and yes, you know, and and Ring and all the pilots were were all experienced flying 200 miles away from the ship on on search legs and finding their way back home. Now we get into you know which way did Waldron turn, and and Clay Fisher in his in his memoir Hook says you know he remembers. And he was questioned on this. I remember vividly, they turned right. We're heading 240. Walter is arguing with, with the group commander on the radio. And then all of a sudden, they, they changed course. And I watched him do it. And I'll never forget it. Richard Woodson, who was a gunner in one of the SBDs behind him. Now, he, he's facing aft. He's a gunner. But, uh, but he was very credible in, in his belief that, no, I, I saw them turn left. Now, he's facing aft. You mean left from uh, as you were facing or left from the direction of the airplane? No, left from the direction of the airplane, which is south. 
Here's two 23, 24 year olds seeing the same thing. They're in the same formation. They see two totally different things. So the personalities on Hornet are an interesting sort of mashup. So Misher, as you said, is a CEO of the carrier. He's known as a strong willed guy, up and comer, fast track, hard charger. Ring is known as a martinet. He's very much into his decisions. And Waldron, you know, at this early phase of the war, has enough flight time, enough experience that he has a strong belief in his outlook, his perception. And so that's what leads to that basic mutiny because there's they don't have exact transcripts of the voice comms. But first, he's so tweaked with the situation that he breaks radio silence as they're heading to the West. And basically he says, hey, CAG, we're going the wrong way. I know that they're south of this heading. CAG says basically, CAG ring says, join up and shut up. And at that point, Waldron maybe says one more time, I say again, we're going the wrong way. We need to deviate to the southwest, not due west. And again, Ring's like, thank you for your input. Stay aboard. And, and at that point, Waldron just takes his guys and drives to the southwest. In my research, Waldron did not give a heading. But he, he said, I, I, I know where the Japanese are. And so, so Ring said, you shut up. I'm leading this formation, not you, in, in so many words. And, and Waldron persisted, as, as you just said. And then Waldron says, well, I, I know, you know, to hell with you. I know where the Japanese are. And, and he left. You yeah, know, so this is, I mean, this is like a court-martial offense. Yeah, right? Absolutely. I mean, this is the first major battle, which we celebrate as this, Prove that the Americans six months after Pearl Harbor have what it takes to win the war. That's kind of the bumper sticker. That's why we named an aircraft carrier after it. That's why streets on every air station fleet wide have are called Midway. Um, there's memorial at the Naval Academy. That's why we do episodes on my channel each year on the anniversary of this famous battle, this signature and turning point battle. But this particular episode within the battle uh, is an example of some of the human side. And it actually is refreshing to me that these guys had the kind of personalities that you and I dealt with when we were trying to get things done, when we were flying airplanes off of aircraft carriers, you know, that's kind of what the punk series and all of your body of work has all, you know, flip. And these are real guys that are dealing with human nature and it's not all so sanitized and everybody loves CAG and he's the smartest guy and he knows how to lead everybody. So as you reminded me of this particular part of the battle, I was like, oh my God, that this is some serious dissension in the ranks during the course of the flight. So Torpedo 8, just whatever the exact heading is, they deviate away from the formation of CAG, which is, as you said, this is 50 some airplanes. So now they're short however many VT8 had. How many airplanes were in 15? 15. So here go 15 devastators, right? Um, yeah. and, and so, and CAG's just like, oh, well, there they go, right? I'm sure it didn't make him happy. And then their part of it becomes the stuff of tragedy and uh, sorrow. Ensign Gay, he was floating and watching the battle uh, as Akagi and the other Japanese carriers get, get hit. But they get torn to shreds by the Zeros, and they have no fighter cover. So ultimately, yes, they did find the Japanese, but it was at a great cost. Yes. Uh, you know, John Waldron, you know, led his squadron to their death. And, and now, you know, was, was there any service? And I would say yes. That uh, you know all, all the all the commotion of, of the of forty Japanese zeros, you know, descending on them and and, and picking them off in ones and twos, uh, all, all the AAA being fired. Uh, that that commotion, um, you know, caused you know some unease in the Japanese ranks. They just finished recovering their morning strike from Midway, the Tomonaga strike. They just finished. 
So, but again, they're, they're, there's cap up in the air and now they're all, they're all, you know, sh shooting their magazines at, at the TBDs and you're going to have to recover them faster than maybe you would plan to. Uh, and, and also, uh, there's evidence that, that, uh, VT6 commanded by Eugene Lindsay is, uh, you know, just as the, the Waldron squadron is getting annihilated, they can see some commotion on the horizon, you know, triple a puffs and, and smoke and, and smoke that the Japanese are making to, uh, to conceal themselves, you know, deliberate smoke from the, from the destroyer escorts. So, uh, and w which led them there. You know, so the Japanese once now they're they're off balance again. Hey, they and, and now they know the Americans are nearby. By the way, and and, that, and so they're having to, to to load airplanes to go a, attack the Americans. So, so that there certainly was that service. But and, that's that's a secondary outcome. Right? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, it is. Yes, and, it and is. So just box score wise, eighteen devastators crashed, ditched. And only one aviator, and that includes pilots and gunners, survived. Right. Even Ensign Gay's gunner was dead by the time he ditched his airplane. That's uh, correct. Before he so, jumped in his so, raft, he made sure he was, in fact, not alive or wounded. And he was the only guy to get a torpedo off, and it, it didn't hit anything. Right. You know, everybody else was shot before they had a chance to pickle any ordnance. So, yes, the Japanese had to react to their presence, but it wasn't at all what their uh, intended outcome was with respect to mission accomplishment. No, it, it should have been, you know, and everyone knew how, how uh, flawed the TBD was, you know, only been in, in service for five years, but it was hopelessly obsolete. So the, the object was roll in with dive bombers, disable the ships, and then you bring in the torpedo pl planes to, to sink them. And, and that, was, that was what they wanted to do. Um, and when you don't have fighters, you don't have Dauntless, all you got is the torpedo planes. That's, that's suboptimum sub tactics, yes. right? So meanwhile, yeah. the balance of CAG rings element is uh, starting to run out of gas, and, and, and uh, particularly the Wildcats at first. And they're, they're pulling up next to them and, like, pointing at their, you know, I, I don't, whatever the signal is for, I'm, I'm bingo fuel. And he's kind of like, get back in position. You know, I got it. I'm I'm sucking for gas too, but just do not leave. And these guys are just peeling off, some with the intent of, of bingoing to Midway, some with the intent of trying to make it back to Mother, to Hornet. Um, but it doesn't work out very good. The the fighters left first. So VF-8 and, and the, the VF-8 commanding officer, uh, uh, Commander Mitchell, you know, his guys are coming up to him and saying, hey, look, I'm, I'm, I'm out of gas here. And he, he would tell them, just get back in formation. I know. And then, but then some of his guys started leaving, started leaving him. And so then, then he obviously turned around and, and, and followed him himself. Um, they had a homing device aboard Hornet, aboard all of our carriers. And, and uh, you know, so he would, uh, he would give you a Morse code letter. And uh, so you look at your chart and you say, okay, I'm getting this Morse code letter. So that means I fly the, the reciprocal of, of, of this direction and I should, I should come home. And, and it worked. Although but it was in, just a, in, it was just a heading, right? It wasn't a range. It, you didn't know it was just a, range. a heading. That's yeah. correct. It was just a heading. So the, the, the VF eight wildcat pilots, you know, use this, they, they, you know, they had their own navigation. They could just, you know, turn the reciprocal of the course they were flying. And, and they flew back and they saw wakes in the distance. And that was Task Force 16. That was home. And they didn't believe it. They were afraid they were Japanese. So they kept to the south and just kept driving on to the east into nothing. And then eventually just, you know, it, it went down in, in, in ones and twos and, and ditched. So how many uh, wildcats was that? Eight. Okay. So we've lost, let me get the numbers right. 18 devastators, eight wildcats so far. 15 devastators, 15 devastators, eight wildcats. Eight wildcats. I, I believe I'm right on that. But, you know, 59 airplanes left Hornet. And so now we're, now we're down two squadrons. So okay. now on, only the SBDs are left. First, it's going to be bombing eight led by Lieutenant Commander Johnson. And, and he takes his squadron toward Midway. Um, Midway can be seen, uh, you know, a pall of black smoke, 
and you got, okay, look at that black smoke and you kind of look and it, they had charts. Okay. Well, that's kind of where midway should be. So that's probably midway that's, that's burning in the distance. So he takes his airplanes there on the way there. His XO took two of his wingmen. They got that good homing signal from Hornet. So they went off toward Hornet. Johnson said, I'm going to, I'm going to go with what I know is there and takes his guys to midway. The Marines shoot at them and, uh, and is, you know, defending the, you know, the, an airplane just to shoot it. And, uh, and some of those SBDs took some damage, but no fatalities. They all landed and, and they, they were able to go back to, uh, to Hornet that afternoon. Yes. Yeah, so they refuel on midway and then fly back to. And, and that's correct. That's correct. Scouting eight led by uh, Lieutenant Commander Walt Rodi, They were able to turn around, fly the recip and fly right back to Hornet. And, uh, and, and with and Clayton Fisher, Ensign Fisher, he left Air Group Commander Ring and, and joined with his squadron and uh, the, the, the scout squadron. And then uh, Ring on his own saw that he had no one on his wing. He could look down both sides. There's no one with me. He, he turned around and, and he uh, was able to fly faster than the others in formation. He was the first one back aboard Hornet. So roughly a third come back. Yes. Okay. A third yes. return. As you said, CAG's the first guy back on deck. These are the days before 06 CAG's. So CAG reports to the captain of the ship, Mitcher, and he's not very happy. Like you said, in the if we were to do a screenplay, it would start with him coming back aboard. And uh, some reports have him going right to his stateroom and not going to the island. Correct. Um, but at some point, um, he did have to answer to the captain and he's like, so what happened? Right. So this particular chapter, the flight to nowhere is a dubious part of the battle of Midway. However, in defense of this air wing and this ship, a lot of what the successes that emerged from the battle of Midway were the same kind of happenstance. You pick a heading and you go with it. You you try to predict the time distance that your enemy is going to be traveling. You try to get inside his head. As you said, part of the strike force was like, they're going to Midway. And others are like, no, they're not going to go directly to Midway. So we need to go north of that. Right. So this is all, there's no macro picture. There's no satellite imagery. There's no Google Earth. You know, this is basically people taking flyers based on hunches and and as you also said that nimitz congratulated his intel guy who was that guy's name edwin layton and yeah, so, uh, and uh, uh commander joseph rogefort was uh, the the crypto analyst at, at station hypo so so together so they, they did uh, the time yeah. distance thing days weeks out and they were they were really close right five minutes five miles that's that's like you know GPS level accuracy in, in the day there, but that was at some level luck. And so before we paint with broad strokes, the failure of CAG ring, we also should just understand the nature of war. It was kind of binary. Either you won big or you lost big. We can all agree, uh, as uh, Cressman and, and Mark Horan said, as a glorious page in our history. So Hoser, always great to have you on the channel. If you haven't read The Silver Waterfall yet, I entreat you to do so. It's a fantastic fictionalized history of the Battle of Midway, written by my good friend and former shipmate, Captain Retired Kevin Hoser Miller. Hoser, we look forward to seeing you in person very soon. I need to get down to Pensacola so we can do an episode at the Museum of Naval Aviation. And if I don't see you there before Tailhook, I look forward to seeing you in Reno in a couple of months time. Enjoy it, Mooch. Thanks for having me aboard. All right. That'll do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything. Become a patron at patreon.com slash Ward Carroll. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.